Thank you so much, Stephen, for inviting me. And hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about two exhibitions that I've had the opportunity to curate over the past few years. And the reason why I decided to share these two projects is because they really kind of set the groundwork for um, why Public Art Fund, why New York City, and hopefully really um, share some insight into my curatorial practice, the way that I work and think about site and publics and communities. So uh, I've been with Public Art Fund for four months, but I'm gonna talk about my role at Crystal Bridges. So for about three and a half years, I was associate curator of contemporary art at Crystal Bridges. And prior to joining the curatorial team there, I was part of the prospect for New Orleans, which is a, a triennial that happens every three years in New Orleans. I was part of the curatorial team that supported artistic director, artistic director Trevor Schoonmaker's exhibition. And so, um, when I came to Crystal Bridges, one of my responsibilities was thinking about the 120-acre, 200-year-old second-growth forest. And you can see the forest here from this bird's eye view. Um, the trail system was connected to the larger trail system in northwest Arkansas. And there was a real kind of emphasis put on thinking about the ways that we could engage the galleries within the museum to the public space around the campus at large. And so six months in, I was asked to put together a proposal for an exhibition that would think about engaging in that way. Where I started was the collection. This is a museum that is still relatively new. And uh, because there hadn't been a museum of this scale in this part of the country prior, I really wanted to rely on the, the collection and the way that the communities and publics that engaged with it had become familiar with um, a kind of history of art, uh, history of the contemporary art, if we can even say that, which is perhaps the past 100 years of contemporary art through the paintings and objects they saw in the galleries. And so one thing that I noticed upon arrival was that there was quite a, a large selection um, of color field paintings. And what I appreciated from the, my predecessors was that they had collected works by people like Felrath Hines, who is a, you know, a painter's painter. Felrath was a color field painter. He was also a conservator at the Smithsonian and um, perhaps didn't get the kind of recognition that he should have during his, his lifetime. Um, similarly, Helen Frankenthaler was really anchoring the collection and this kind of section of color field paintings as she rightly should. So I took color field painting as a departure and proposed an exhibition of sculptures and site-specific artist projects that really relied on um, some of these kind of tenets of color field painting. So, um, but also imagined color field in the expanded field. And, you know, a great artist who is in the Crystal Bridges collection who was thinking like this is Sam Gilliam, who I'll talk about a little bit later. So um, one of my tasks I mentioned was to think about how I could engage the, the museum with the larger North Forest campus. And so this, this view here kind of gives you a sense of the different parts of the campus that I activated and really thought as uh, thought of as sites for perhaps non-traditional installation that would get people excited about going to the North Forest. So um, I there are like, let's say there's three points of entry for uh, for this project. And the first one was the front door to the museum. And so there you saw a soft effront backdrop for the nearby Collegium, which is a series of four kind of, they, they are reminiscent of a theatrical backdrop, four artworks that have this kind of very flat, they, they read almost as if they're architectural, the tiles reference Mediterranean architecture, and they're kind of this very easy, whimsical point of entry for the entrance to the, to the museum itself. And so this was the first thing, if you were visiting and walking through the front door that you would see. And now I'm gonna talk about the North Forest activations. And I think it's also really important to mention that these two artists, so the two works, the one in the center and on the left are 
by Sam Falls. And the work on the far left is actually, was originally commissioned by Public Art Fund for an exhibition of Sam's work in New York in 2014. And so even before having this role with the organization, I was really looking to Public Art Fund as a kind of anchor within the public art ecosystem and within the field of, you know, the most compelling cutting edge public art. And then the work on the right by Amanda Ross Ho is a work that was commissioned by Public Art Fund also. And um, just to kind of talk, I know that some people on the Zoom are students or learning or like recent alums. Um, so kind of a curatorial strategy was to think about how I could borrow already extant works. And this is obviously something that is used in the development of a checklist or an exhibition, but um, often it's more, what does a, a museum have in their collection that I can borrow or perhaps you know, a private collector, but there are also these, these major commissions and, and outdoor sculpture that is available for loan. Here's an example of Sarah Brayman's here. Now, Sarah created a, um, what essentially was a sundial. And again, this idea of the body was really prominent in the conception of this exhibition. We wanted people to understand different ideas around color theory, the relationship their body has to sight and place in an easily accessible way. And so at a certain time of day, of course, light would cascade into this sculpture and then project from these, these laminated glass with gels would project light onto the surface around the sculpture. Also, depending on where your body was placed in relationship to the work, the overlapping colors would create a new color. You saw in the, the kind of bird's eye view that, that there, is, there was a kind of a central um, atrium to the galleries. And I really wanted to have an artist activate that site. And so worked with Claire Helen Ashley. This was also a work that already existed called Close Encounters, Adam's Madam. And Claire sees this as a painting. And so from different points of the campus, this is from across the museum. So you might be standing out on the balcony overlooking the water and kind of looking to the other part of the museum. And you see this really kind of interesting form emerging. So I wanted people to also think about site and their body in relationship to the already excellent architecture. So here's a few views closer up. And then people were invited to walk into that, that open atrium space. So the image on the far left is what your body might see if you were walking in there. And of course they could touch the inflatable and kind of engage with it. And as I mentioned before, Claire really saw this as a painting. There were programmatic efforts around the sculptures and, um, you know, this, this work by Amanda Ross Ho is, it's a sculpture about photography. And she kind of, she created a similar work for the MCA Chicago's, um, for their kind of, uh, they have a plaza project, but shifted it to think about uh, facial recognition software, iPhones, and digital technology. What I loved about this work was that it acted as a beacon in the North Forest. So if you were going to see a performance, it's a, you know, of a glowing green rectangle. And I know that sometimes, uh, depending on where we are in our careers, we often think about like, um, you know, what's the most compelling concept and that I can rely upon to develop an exhibition. But it's also really crucial to think about how people and audiences are engaging with the ideas and making sure that there's multiple points of access kind of across different um, uh, forms of knowledge. Another way that I really wanted to connect the galleries inside with the forest was through sound. And so I commissioned a local artist named Amos Cochran to create a sound work. So it was installed across six speakers in the forest. And as your body moved through space, you would see the artworks and hear the sound. And so it almost was like, again, the sound was a beacon and beckoning you to move through the installation. So once uh, you got to the North Forest, you encountered Odili Donalodita's negative space. And 
I invited, this was one of the new commissions for the project, and I invited O'Dealy to think about a sculpture or, or what would it mean for him to create a site-specific work for the forest. And when I commissioned this work, it was summer 2018. And at that time, we were just hearing about families being pulled apart at the U.S.-Mexican border and kind of separated and sent to detention centers, uh, people that were immigrating. And Odili himself immigrated during a moment of crisis. And so he really wanted to speak to this moment. Using color theory, which is if something that's inherent to his practice, Odili took the colors of the American flag, so red, blue, and white, and combined them with the complementary colors of green, orange, and black, and installed them in this kind of a colonnade that if it were to go on forever would create an X and then essentially cross again. In order to access the North Forest, you had to walk underneath this, this installation. There was no way to access it otherwise unless you kind of walked directly into the trees. And this is really intentional for, for Odili. He was making a statement just sharing that we're all implicated in what's happening at our borders, whether or not we're actually saying something about it. And also I should mention that this was 13 four, 13 four by five foot flags and 20 foot flag poles. And the 13 is referencing the original 13 colonies. So there was a lot of time between color field and this next exhibition I'm gonna talk about, but I'm gonna spend the majority of my time talking about promise, witness, remembrance, because I think there's still a lot to unpack around curatorial strategies and methodology, um, and the ways that we approached this exhibition. So as I'm sure everyone is aware of, Tanahesi Coates commissioned Amy Sherrill to paint a portrait of Breonna Taylor that was gonna be on the cover of Vanity Fair in the September 2020 issue. And I received an email from the then director of the Speed Museum, Stephen Riley, um, in late October, no, late November, 2020 inviting me to embark on a journey with the museum. And he said that the museum had already had Amy's permission to show the painting. They were working with Brianna Taylor's family and they had a, an incredible educator on the team who was building steering committees, local steering committees to give feedback to the exhibition. They were looking for a curator to kind of, it was like the final piece of this system. And I felt very compelled by the project and absolutely said yes. And a big reason why I said yes was that the museum had already identified their priorities. And that's just a kind of a bit of advice that I would share to you know, emerging curatorial, uh, emerging curators is when you're invited to do projects um, like something like this, just understanding what the organization or institution has prioritized and understanding what they have set up within this system for success. And for me, it was very clear that we were aligned. So I'm gonna show a quick clip. As a city struggling to respond, to grieve, to react, to move forward, following the killing of Breonna Taylor, other deaths that followed, a year of protests, an enormous spike in gun violence across the city and the country. This exhibit from the beginning has represented our attempt, like what would it look like for a museum to try to serve a city going through what Louisville's been going through to try to serve our country at a time of need. When you walk into the museum, into the galleries, on your sight line, you see the portrait of Brianna Taylor painted by Amy Sherald. It's the only thing you see. If you've come to the museum to just see that painting, you know exactly where to find it. If you wanna engage with the exhibition as a concept, you can also do that. So the intention with this placement was to make the portrait accessible, to make people feel comfortable, to know where they were intending to go, to also understand the importance of this exhibition in relationship to the story of Brianna Taylor. The title Promise, Witness, Remembrance was developed from a conversation I had with Tamika Palmer when I asked her what this exhibition could do for her and represent for her daughter's legacy. It was also important to understand that this 
exhibition was meant to connect the local to the national. So when I first started on this journey, I knew where the painting was going to end up. I knew that it was going to be co-acquired by the Smithsonian and by the Speed Museum. And so I, I looked pointedly to how I could start that conversation between the local and national throughout the exhibition, thinking about promise, you know, so the sections, the artworks, artists. Oh, say can you see by freedom's clear light. The first section is promise, which is the promise of a nation and the symbols that the promise is meant to afford its citizens. Key things like national anthems, flags, voting rights, and the military that uphold them are what artists and artworks in this section look at. Hank Willis Thomas has the two works, the flags that are flanking the doors, and each star represents a person killed by gun violence in the United States in the year that they represent. That dying. The next section, Witness, thinks not only about the curatorial framework, but also about visitors to the museum. I anticipate many will be first-time visitors. So this, this portion of the exhibition really unpacks what artists do. Artists help us understand the contemporary moment. And in this section, I've paired historical works with more contemporary ones to tell a larger story about witnessing and sometimes protesting. The muffled drums is one of the first protests or marches for black lives in the United States. And it was organized by the NAACP and then the protest photographs of Louisville, focusing on historic, contemporary, you know, timely but enduring. Remembrance is a section that looks at artworks that have been created to honor those lost to gun violence and or police brutality and their legacies. The exhibition was developed in conversation with many key constituents. I initially developed a national panel of advisors to guide the conversation from the onset. These people come from very different walks of life, They've all experienced gun violence and or police brutality, either in their families or communities, or stand in solidarity. I spent a lot of time listening to the Louisville Steering Committee and also the team at the Speed Museum. And from these conversations, alongside listening to Tamika Palmer, is how the curatorial framework developed. I'm hoping that this type of work, this type of co-creation, where we've worked with community. Community has had a voice, not just a superficial voice, but a really in-depth autonomy as of the outcome that happens. I'm hoping that that becomes a new model, that institutions learn from us, that this can happen. You can work with community and make programming and exhibitions together. So at The Speed, our mission is to invite everyone to celebrate art forever. So consistent with that, and also because of the nature of this exhibit, Everything about it is free. Um, admission, parking, we want this to be extremely accessible for a lot of reasons. One, no one should be making money off of this experience, and we aren't. But even more so, we want everyone to come through this exhibit together. Every visitor is going to be different. I'm going to have a different experience because I'm a black woman. Um, I'm at the heart of things that are happening here, so I experience it as first person. But if you have not been at the heart of what has happened here, taking that in and really understanding someone else's truth, right, through their voice, through their eyes is important, but also really reflecting on your place in that, right? Have you been supportive of this movement? Has it been a little um, intimidating or frightening at some points? And really examining kind of uh, how we can move forward together. Okay. And so, you know, when I first said yes to the project, I was really um, plagued with a lot of questions. Um, first off, this posthumous presentation, uh, a representation of uh, a woman who, in the city, the exhibition was going to be opening at. Um, 
was killed by the police in a very high profile situation and the community was still healing. So it was seven months after March 13th, 2020. And those of you who read the, the exhibition text uh, can understand, you know, I, I dive in a bit more in my essay around where I was March, March 13th, 2020, and what I was thinking about. And seven months later, eight months later, I was saying yes to a project that for the place and the site that it was situated in was still so unresolved. And this is, as an aside, this is, um, hopefully you're seeing a thread here now, this real deep engagement with site and location and institutional priorities, but also leading as a curator in conversation with all of these other um, stakeholders. And so this was a very new task for me. And the questions that came up were, how does curatorial work address a site of trauma? Should it? Who were the key players? And what is the project's focus and goal? And how can we keep this in focus? So all that I was tasked with at the beginning was thinking about the portrait, but I knew right away that it was going to be an exhibition. I also know that the museum didn't necessarily have that expectation of me, but I knew very quickly that it was going to be an exhibition. And so anchoring a conceptual framework in this way with this kind of exhibition proved to be challenging. And of course, you know, I'm one curator, I have one methodology, and there could have been 30 ways of doing this or more, but this is the approach that I took. I spoke to Brianna Taylor's mother. I am, um, we, we were in dialogue early and often. And at the beginning, I was really just kind of trying to weigh all of the input I was getting and prioritize. And so I sent her a text message. And I just said, what does this exhibition mean to you and your daughter's legacy? And this is what she replied on December 23rd. I was you know, on, on vacation from work and I was hurriedly working <laughs> at all hours. And what she said was, this exhibition will continue to do what Brie has always done for us. And that is to continue to bring people together. Only this time people are wanting to learn her story and to continue to stand for her and even celebrate some on how she changed the world. And then she identified three ways that she saw Brianna Taylor's story changing the world. And from those three ways, those three kind of statements is how we developed the three sections. So the mark that she left upon all of us, and that is promise. The struggles we went and are continuing to go through to get justice for her, that's witness. And the laws and policies that were changed because of the injustice that she experienced is remembrance. And that also is kind of the overall laws and policies and the injustices and artists that were responding to these kinds of themes. So when I, when I decided to do this project, I was living in Northwest Arkansas, height of the pandemic. We did not have vaccines and it was winter time. Um, I had actually never been to Louisville before. So most of the work that I was doing with the team was on Zoom or FaceTimes. I attempted to travel twice and twice was not able to in the, in the early stages because of weather. So I knew that I was going to need, um, just because of all of these kinds of interesting barriers to being really close to the site um, and also knowing the importance of this project to this community, I knew that I was going to need a kind of cabinet um, a team of people that I could bounce ideas off of before I brought them to the Louisville Steering Committee. So the museum asked me to set up a kind of uh, a way, a methodology for to, to get feedback. And so what I did was I set up a, a, some early meetings at the national panel, got their feedback, then went to the Louisville Steering Committee. And then once I had pinged back and forth a few times and had my final proposal, I presented it to Brianna Taylor's mom. 
And the National Advisory Panel, and I, I, I love advisory panels, especially when they're primarily artists. I just really feel like having a kind of key core group to guide and to kind of point out perhaps blind spots or provide opportunities for further insight were crucial. And I chose this advisory panel for very distinct reasons. And I'm gonna walk through who they are and why. So Mecca Brooks works in Hank Willis Thomas's studio. And Hank's work is primarily focused, well, most of it is social justice focused. He actually has an exhibition on view at Jack Shaneman at both locations. You should probably see it. Um, some of the work that's similar to the work in the exhibition is on view in this gallery show. Um, Hank started making work about losing his cousin Sangha to gun violence 21 years ago. And I knew that his experience of working around this kind of trauma and with community would be invaluable to what I was trying to do. So both Mecca and Hank joined the team. The Astro Gates had worked with the Tamir Rice Foundation to successfully cite the gazebo where Tamir Rice was killed. Uh, it recited in Chicago and he worked with um, Tamir Rice's mother. And one of the fears I had early on was really getting this wrong. Um, we had seen colleagues with good intentions um, approach this kind of subject matter and have not the, um, I would say most successful outcomes. And so I really wanted the Astor as a part of this team and to really be guided by his input and the success that he had shown with citing the gazebo. John Cesare Goff is an artist who made a film that I exhibited in the uh, In Promise Witness Remembrance. And the film is called Battlefield, A Site of Reckoning. And it is created about the Mother Emanuel AME shooting um, that happened, I would say, maybe seven years ago now, five to seven years ago. John's father is a part of the church, and this is John's community. So again, an artist really working with a site of trauma, uh, making a work that responds to it. Raymond Green is a, a colleague that was in Northwest Arkansas. And um, Raymond's cousin is Alton Starling, and Alton was a high profile police brutality case in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Lakeisha Leak is a arts administrator in Chicago and her cousin is Trayvon Martin. Of course, Amy Sherrill, because Amy was really one of the major catalysts for bringing the portrait to Louisville. And I really felt that she was a key stakeholder in realizing the project. And then the final person is Dr. Allison K. Young, who's an art historian who's based in New Orleans and teaches at Tulane. She is a global contemporary uh, historian with a focus in contemporary African art. So then the exhibition, as I mentioned in the beginning, was basically broken out into three sections. And the first gallery was Promise. And so what I was really trying to communicate in this section was, um, I, I shouldn't say communicate, what I was really trying to show were examples of artists that were interrogating these kind of anchors and ideologies of the United States. So national anthems, voting rights, constitutions, and a military that protect the rights of citizens can all be seen as symbolic representations of a nation and its promise. The promise of the United States is rooted in what our forefathers called, quote, unalienable rights, end quote, outlined within the Constitution, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In this first gallery, contemporary artists explored ideologies of the United States of America through the symbols that uphold them. The Star Spangled Banner, the 2020 American election, the preamble to the Constitution, and the military. The four works in this section asked us to consider these symbols of the United States and how they have changed and shifted over time, provoking questions such as, what does the promise of the United States mean to all of its citizens and for whom are these rights afforded? And so here's a few kind of deeper examples of artists that were engaging with the Star Spangled Banner. And one of the reasons why I looked at the Star Spangled Banner at first was because Dr. Kevin Crosby was um, when he was giving the eulogy at Muhammad Ali's funeral, and Muhammad Ali is from Louisville. He talks about the second verse in the Star Spangled Banner, which points to, it's not the verse that we learn, and it actually has quite challenging and limiting language 
around rights afforded to citizens. And so I really wanted to unpack that. And of course, Ali is a legend, not only globally, but really in Louisville and Dr. Kevin Crosby is well known. And so I wanted to make sure that I was signaling through these artworks and through this engagement with the Star Spangled Banner that I understood what was happening in this kind of local conversation. I was pointing to this contemporary moment. Here's a few installation views. The We the pa People that you see right there just above the wainscoting is by Nari Ward. Nari's work is in the collection. And then of course, these flags by Hank Willis Thomas that are each star on the flags represents a person killed by gun violence in the United States in the years that the flags were created. And so having 2019 and 2020 flanking the doorway of the speed, uh, excuse me, of these galleries when you walked into them, not only included Brianna Taylor, but also included this larger history, uh, I guess you can call it history now, but this kind of larger trajectory of the protest movements of 2020 and the people that were impacted, because there were quite a few moments locally of um, leaders having incidents of gun violence that was you know, taking their lives. And it was, it was an opportunity to, to kind of visualize the community and to call people into the space. Here's a view of um, the Glen Ligon aftermath, which is November 4th, 2020. Also during the development of the exhibition, um, the, the day of the first national panel meeting was January 6th, 2021, which was wild. And I actually stayed away from the news that day because I was really excited and a little nervous about presenting my early ideas. And so I was focused on my work and I didn't want any distractions. And some of the national panelists were messaging me and asking, you know, are we still meeting? And I, I found it to be really curious um, that they would ask if we were still meeting. Obviously, it was on the calendar. And then I came to understand very quickly that there was an insurrection at the Capitol. Um, and so it felt really appropriate to include Glenn Ligon's aftermath, which is essentially the day after the presidential election, because it pointed to the moment that we were living in and including the, the time that the exhibition was being developed. One thing to kind of zoom into this section um, a kind of subtext was using the co-acquisition as a framework. And so I knew early on that the painting was going to be co-acquired by the Speed Museum and the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. So knowing that this was going to happen, I looked at the Speed Museum's collection and tried to identify artworks by local artists because I felt that it was important to include local artists in the conversation, but also came across this work that as um, has a larger, it was a bust for a larger sculpture called The Spirit of Freedom. It's by a Louisville artist named Ed Hamilton. So they have the bust that was created for this larger monument that is in DC. And the Spirit of Freedom is meant to represent the African-American soldiers that fought during the Civil War. So just zooming in there on kind of curatorial choices that you can see here and ways, curatorial decisions, and ways that I was setting up a conversation about this co-acquisition and the connection of the local, the local being Louisville, to the national, and the national being the United States, the national being the capital, knowing that these two museums were both, you know, one was in Louisville, one was in DC, and then also connecting to the national panel. So having the Louisville Steering Committee being the local voice and the national panel being representative of national communities and publics. The second gallery was Witness. And I really felt like it was gonna be important to um, explain what contemporary artists do. We were really anticipating many new visitors to the exhibition. And I believe we had something like 15,000 new guests and the exhibition ran from excuse me, new visitors to the museum and the exhibition ran from April 7th, 2021 through June 13th. And I think with the limited time tickets, there were only 40 or 50 slots available a day and the museum was open three or four days a week. So it was not at full capacity to be able to have 15,000 first time visitors was really something that we're all quite proud of. But with new visitors requires, of course, or anticipation of new visitors requires a shift, right? And that shift starts with us as curators. It starts in the way that we're talking about concepts and ideas. 
It starts in the way that we're using language. And so the witness section was also an opportunity to historically anchor this moment of protest in a kind of larger history of 100 years of protest for rights, specifically for Black rights and the Black Lives Matter movement. And I'll show further on in the presentation what I mean and how I articulated that through artworks and objects. But it also made sense of why would a painter paint a portrait of Amy Sherald? Why would someone do that who didn't know her? So artists help us understand the contemporary moment, often responding to the politics, fears, fashion, and cultural trends of the time they're living in. And this language I'm reading in, in these slides is the wall text. These are unprecedented times where in the midst of a global pandemic, incidents of police brutality and gun violence continue to happen with almost no recourse. Here in Louisville, the family of Brianna Taylor has not received the justice they seek. These galleries include an intergenerational grouping of artists who have made work that bears witness to the time that it was created. From Louisvillean Sam Gilliam, pushing the boundaries of painting, to Alicia Wormsley's Afrofuturist Manifesto for Black Lives, and Khalil Joseph's Fugitive Newscast, to photographs from the protests created by Louisville photographers and activists. This combination of artist responses to expectations, ideas, and fears are both current and enduring. So here you can see a view. Um, one of the other kind of formal devices that I used as a curator in this exhibition was the drape. And the drape has this sense of like, it's languid, right? It's like, it has a heaviness. And you can see the drape in Sam Gilliam's painting, Carousel Form 2 here on the left, which this was the first time this work was installed in the round. And it was really important to me to install this work so that it was more sculptural because I was thinking about the way that different people might engage with the painting. And then through the doorway, you can see Hank Willis Thomas's flag from 2019 that is hanging and draping on the ground because there are so many stars. This parabolic structure continues with Lorna Simpson's same, which is a work from 1992 that is in the Speed Museum's collection that essentially is Two, a portrait of two separate women with their backs, there's text included that alludes to a kind of sense of um, making assumptions about bodies because of how they look or how you perceive them. And then finally, having Sam Gilliam's work hung in this way kind of created these, um, it's almost like diagramming the sentence of Alicia Wormsley's There Are Black People in the Future, which was installed towards the top of uh, the galleries in this continuous text and, you know, someone like Felix Gonzalez Torres or Jenny Holzer was definitely an inspiration for the installation of this work. But depending on where your body would stand in relationship to the Sam Gilliam, you might have a different provocation of the text. So the future there are, are Black people, people in the future, there are Black people, really different ways that the text would kind of engage with the other forms in the space. And that was completely intentional. And then something that you don't see here was um, some feedback I was given was that the, you know, the exhibition was going to be very heavy and that I might want to create moments of repose. And so I invited Alicia, um, Alicia Hurlsley from the Nat Ministry to create a meditation for Brianna. And there was a text, a wall text right behind Sam Gilliam's that said a moment to pause. And you could text 424242, I think, to this number, and you'd be able to download the, uh, the meditation. And I imagine people would sit on the ground underneath Sam's work and just close their eyes and, and take time. I want to talk a bit about the color here, but also the intersection of Terry Adkins' muffled drums with the protest photographs. So the wall color here is actually a deep purple. And um, early on, I received feedback from the steering committee that I should incorporate more color into the exhibition because Brianna was a very colorful person. And so I asked her mom what her favorite colors were. And she said, Kentucky blue and purple. And one of the, um, the exhibitions coordinator said, I, I was like, I'd love to find a purple for the wall, something that's, you know, subtle, but communicates this idea of like a portrait. What does it mean to create an exhibition that is somewhat engaging with the portrait of a person. And 
we used color in that way. So she suggested this deep purple, which was so strong. So we decided that as you're moving through the space into the remembrance section, you would go from a stark white traditional gallery wall color into this deep purple. Something to also note is that John Cesare Goff's film was playing in the distance. And because the galleries were linear, when you walked into the space on your sight line, you see the portrait of Brianna Taylor, and you'd hear the various sound. There were a few works that had sound in the exhibition, but essentially John Cesare Goff's work was beckoning you further into the space. And so it's almost like a processional in that way. So to zoom in on the witness section, I really wanted to anchor this moment of 2020 and 2021 in a larger historical trajectory. So how was I gonna do that? I thought maybe I could have a timeline, but I'm a curator, so why don't I use artworks and rely on artists to communicate that? And that's what I did. And so you can see here, Terry Atkins muffled drums, which was borrowed from the Tate. And when it's presented, it's either presented in a stack of eight or 11. And um, the eight drums here are stacked. And at times they would be used when Terry performed as part of the Lone Wolf Recital Corps. The reason why this work is called Muffled Drums is based off of an archival photograph. This photograph is taken from the New York Times, I believe it was 1907, um, but I'd have to check my dates on that. So there was a protest organized by the NAACP and it was down Fifth Avenue here in New York. And the New York Times reports on it with this photograph and they said 8,000 men, women, and children marched to the sound of muffled drums. Now, this was a silent protest. And you can see here in the, um, just vaguely see in the banner that's being held, uh, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so this is one of those moments where the exhibition is speaking to itself. In the first galleries, we were talking about these kind of core symbols of the United States and the ideologies that they're meant to represent and asking the question for whom. And here we're looking at an archival image that informed the, uh, Terry Adkins' creation of muffled drums and also anchors this moment, uh, excuse me, it was 1917 is the date. And the reason why um, this silent protest parade happened was because it was a particular, particularly violent year. And there were lynchings in East St. Louis. There was a lot happening in the United States and the NAACP was starting to organize in New York City on this national stage. And so a hundred years later, we're seeing protests for black lives erupting across the United States and globally. And that is what these photographs here that are these these nine photographs hung in a linear way, kind of intersecting with Terry's sculpture. These photographs were created by five Louisville-based photographers, and they're hung in a style, or excuse me, in a way that they are, um, they're, chrono they're chronological. So the first image on the left is from April, and so on and so forth. These works by the, the photographers are now all in the Speed Museum's collection. Another way that this exhibition was anchored in a kind of historic moment, now this is just something that was in the archive that was waiting to be unearthed. So we all are probably familiar with this image of the painting of Brianna Taylor that was on the September 2020 issue of Vanity Fair. It was circulated widely on social media. The image on the right is from the September, October 20, excuse me, 1970 issue of Art in America. And the painting on the cover is Sam Gilliam Carousel Form 2, which is the exact work that was in the witness section of the exhibition that happened to be in the Speed Museum's collection. So now we have two collection paintings from 50 years, uh, you know, time difference on them. One that's thinking about abstraction and one that is really talking about the figure, but both of them are really thinking about history, moment, and the body. And I just found this to be incredibly um, uh, fascinating. And it was one of those aha moments that, again, we couldn't have created this. It already existed. It was just there for to be unearthed. 
with research. And so within the, um, the Art in America, you see Sam Gilliam's carousel form here. And as you see on both sides, it's wall bound. So again, the work not shown in the round until this exhibition. In the fourth gallery was the remembrance section. And this is where I was including a few other artists work that were thinking about those lost to gun violence and or police brutality. So this is an installation view. And remember I mentioned John Cesare Goff's film. We were able to screen it almost wall size and the audio walked you through the space. So this is your sightline of John's film and the portrait. Again, images by Nick, uh, images of work by Nick Cave and Carrie James Marshall and on your sightline in the distance, the portrait. And again, here we see that deep purple wall color that, you know, to the naked eye, the camera always shows more. So to the naked eye, it really, it looked very dark, almost black. And then I wanna talk about the placement of the portrait as I wrap up my kind of conceptualization of this exhibition. Um, as I mentioned early on, we knew we were gonna have many first time visitors. And so I really wanted people to understand where they were going. And ultimately, this exhibition led me to wanting to work more directly in public space and have a more direct relationship between artists and audience, which is what got me here to Public Art Fund. Um, but at the time of thinking of this exhibition, I just wanted to make sure that people knew where they were going. And museums, if you're not comfortable in spaces or galleries or exhibition spaces, oftentimes have barriers to entry. And some of these barriers to entry could be a staircase to ascend, trying to find the front door, cost to get in. How am I supposed to act in this space? What am I supposed to do? And so after kind of moving through all those barriers, typically when people feel vulnerable or uncomfortable in situations, they just avoid that. We're, we're humans, that's what we do. Um, and so it requires a kind of level of vulnerability to bring yourself to a place and get uncomfortable and be, feel comfortable in your discomfort. And I really wanted to have the work be an anchor and the portrait on your sight line. The minute you walked in the door, you knew where you were going. You didn't have to rely on someone else's knowledge because the minute you got there, you could see where you wanted to go. And if you wanted to engage with the exhibition as a concept, you could look at the galleries, which were laid out in kind of these processional rectangles that led up to the portrait, or you could just go right down the center to the portrait. And here is a view of the galleries from the door. So it literally was all you saw. You didn't even have to think about another exhibition or the exhibition in its entirety, any other artwork if you didn't want to. And then finally, the timeline. So, you know, as, as curators, um, especially if you're working within an institution, a museum, the, the text that's on the wall is often that authoritative voice, right? It's the voice of the institution. And the voice of the institution is telling you what you're supposed to see and understand about what you're looking at. And so to call people into the space, I really wanted to seed some of that space to another voice, multiple voices. And I did that throughout the exhibition. Um, I definitely knew I wanted a timeline of Brianna's life because I realized that the exhibition was posthumous because of what happened to her and her untimely death, but that she was had a whole life. And I knew that I was not the person to write this timeline because I didn't know her. And so I, when I talked to her mom about my concept here, I said, you know, there's some local writers that I think would be really great to do this. And she said, I'll write it. And so I couldn't have asked for a better scenario of a mother telling the story of her daughter's life. And so what we decided to do in that final gallery on your sightline when you walked in was the portrait and on all of the walls surrounding was this timeline printed at 100 point font. So it was almost like an exhibition within an exhibition. And then of course, thinking about after the portrait, right? So you've walked through, you've had this moment, it's heavy, 
what do you do then? And I really believe that it's the responsibility to care for our audiences. And so we installed a few works that were outside of the cinema and it's called the Cinema Corridor. Right when you would leave Gallery 5, you turn to your left and on your sight line would be this work by Hank Willis Thomas called Remember Me. So the neon is glowing and it says, Remember Me. And in front of you, you're seeing the portrait of Brianna. You walk through this really brightly lit corridor, stairwell into the space with Khalil Joseph's Black News and Remember Me. We also included this interpretive moment where we prompted people to share their feedback. And so that was an opportunity to, to visualize you know, your thoughts on this exhibition and they were hung in the space. Um, we also had tables and chairs and opportunities for people to just kind of take time. And I just wanted to briefly go through the kind of the steering committee and their impact and what I, what I really ultimately learned from them. So they were led by Toya Northington who is now, I believe her title is director of community engagement, the Speed Art Museum, or something like that. She, for her work on this project, has rightly been promoted. Um, I worked with the steering committee when they said they they said we really want more local artists in the exhibition. And I said, great. Can you help me with that? Um, can you introduce me to photographers who are documenting the protest movement? Perhaps do the research for me because. I can't travel right now, can't do studio visits as I traditionally would. And they developed um, a spreadsheet with all of their kind of shared research. And I just combed through it, went to people's websites, did Zoom studio visits, phone calls, and narrowed it down to five photographers. And here's an example of their work. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without the steering committee. So that kind of co-collaborative process the research really living with that committee and, and, and being integral to the curatorial process. Of course, I mentioned the purple color and wanting brighter objects. And this is a, a triptych created by Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. Magda was already thinking about and already creating a work in response to what happened to Brianna Taylor. And Magda is a, a close, Dear, a dear friend of mine and, and an artist that I really respect and admire. And so uh, when I realized that she was already creating this work and it was bright and colorful, I suggested we include it in the exhibition. And this work is now in the Speed Museum's collection. And I was going to talk about counter public, but I feel like we're at time. So I'm just gonna stop there and open to your questions. Great, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, there's so much to talk about. So let's begin, though, with um, people in our public audience. <clears throat> if you have any questions, either you can um, turn on your camera and unmute yourselves, or you can write in chat what your question or comment is. I just, I just wondered, as I'm wondering about your role as curator mm -hmm. in uh, designing events that surrounded the exhibition and, and, and whether that fell to you or did it fall to someone else? Um, and then I wondered what the uh, public reception was in that local area. It's a great question. Um, so the steering committee was responsible for programs and they worked with the education department, which was phenomenal. Um, and that was very much their, their responsibility. Okay. Um, I just went back to the speed for a book launch because the catalog came out and I was on a panel with four other artists that were in the exhibition and um, I was really humbled by how well received the exhibition was and how many people thanked me. Um, one of the photographers, I, I met her for the first time, she was on the panel um, and her name is T.A. Yero and we hadn't met before because she said she was nervous to say hello to me at the reception opening and it was also COVID, so we were all masked and social distanced. Um, but she just said, you know, thank you so much. I never imagined that my work would be in the collection of this museum. And um, I, I feel really, um, I feel really connected to that community. I felt super supported. I, there are so many people who continue to thank me. Um, and so I wasn't even aware of the impact that, you know, very simple decisions can have. 
um, such as listening and responding. Yeah, for sure. You know? Very powerful. And, and I, I'm, I'm super grateful that they allowed me into that space. And um, Four Freedoms invited Tamika Palmer and I to create a billboard for their last billboard campaign. Um, and so we collaborated on a billboard for Brianna. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that finally this this incident is being investigated properly by the Department of Justice. Thank you. Okay, so Barbara has a question. Also, if you if you want to speak, please, I am happy to just talk casually or if you want to put your question in the chat. I just wanted to thank you for this wonderful presentation. It's very illuminating uh, what the tasks of a curator need to do. And uh, congratulations on a beautiful exhibition. Very powerful. Thank Glad you. I was here. Thank you. Thank you.